Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, guys, before we jump into the reports this week, we've got a really cool opportunity for you. We have partnered with AFCO, and they are offering all of our listeners a free sun protection mask with any purchase of AFCO products. They make a ton of great products for all types of anglers. All you have to do to get your coupon code is text FISHING to 314 314- Six six five one seven six seven. Again, just text the word fishing to three one four six six five one seven six seven to subscribe to our email list and we'll send you the promo code via email. All right, guys, we have a great Alabama saltwater fishing report lined up for you this week. But first, let's take a few minutes to check out a few of this week's great sponsors. This week's Alabama saltwater fishing report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have Atco, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five-star star yamaha and mercury mechanics also if you're looking for a street legal electric golf cart go check out their atric golf carts sportsman's marine on highway 98 and they also have a downtown location next to mr jeans beans in fairhope alabama and also brought to you by bucks island they have new pontoon boats bass boats bow riders and aluminum boats for sale they provide boat service on all kinds of boats even if they weren't purchased from bucks Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. All right, folks, I am your host, Butch Theory, back again this week. Thank you for joining me again on the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. We have some great information lined up for you. Hopefully, we'll give you some direction this weekend if you're going to be able to get out and enjoy this weather we're going to be having. You guys stay tuned. We'll give you some great reports. All right, let's head on down and get our first report of the day. Let's get a bummy adventure. Welcome back to the show, Matthew. What's the, what's the Bama Beach bum been up to? Not much, man. I'm, I've actually been fishing in Alabama. You know, you've checked with me a few times, and I've been bouncing around a lot. I yeah. even did a show with Joe because I was fishing so much over that way. So yeah. it's, it's good to be back on the Alabama side of things and talk about my home waters. Yeah, for sure, man. You got to pop your Northwest Florida fishing report, Cherry. That's fun. I know. I'm getting all over the place. Getting global, man. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's like you needed us for that. <laughs> well, what's what's been going on, man? What's you been seeing on the beaches over there in Gulf Shores and wherever you've been f- frequenting? Yeah, so it, it I will say this. I'm going to start with this. It's been a disappointing year for me and for what I've seen in the beach for redfish. I don't know. I can't put my finger on anything, Hmm. but, you know, generally speaking, I would say over the last several years, you can expect realistically to start seeing slot redfish and the bull redfish pretty consistently along the beaches starting in September. And I have just not seen that. Not And not only from me, but from other anglers and keeping up with it, there's certain areas like that generally will, you always have a decent shot at redfish. And what I'm talking about is around Fort Morgan, around the point, like that's not been different there, but I'm just, I'm referencing the beach as a whole, like just any stretch of beach, any random stretch of beach, usually you can realistically start to expect to see redfish it just anywhere and have a decent shot at that. And I had not, I have not caught, like the first redfish out of the surf all summer and late summer and even into the fall until this past week, just from a random stretch of beach, you know, there, again, there's certain areas that generally will hold them passes inlets, jetties, you know, and you can be fishing the Gulf side on the beach and catch them there. But I'm again, want to drive home. I'm just talking any random stretch of beach. It's been kind of scarce on the redfish, but did see some this week. So I don't know if that's, you know, it, it's very late. I, I don't understand it. And I've talked to several other anglers and they've experienced the same thing. It's It's been a weird year for redfish. I'm kind of disappointing for that. A lot of other things have been great. We've had a great year. And what you can expect to see in the fall, um, I, I would say Pompano is probably compensated for that because we've had a really actually an incredible fall Pompano run. But I just wanted to open up with saying, yeah. Where are those dadgum redfish? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it kind of seems like it's been hit or miss over on this side as far as our 
inshore guys, it seems like the numbers aren't there. Of course, you know, we don't want to start speculating about the kill and all that. I mean, yeah. who, know, who knows? Yeah. I think it's all probably cyclical. That's just where my mind goes first. And so if mine does, I would assume that our listeners go there as well. Oh, that redfish kill, kill them all. That's right. That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. And I, the word you used. I think is, is is how I would subscribe or, or describe it as is cyclical. Yes. You know, we go through these cycles where, for whatever reason, whatever have, reason, yeah, we don't know necessarily. Yes, these these species do weird things, and so for whatever, and we'll have great runs at different times of the year, or even different in, individual years for species, or bad runs, or whatever. And I would say what's been disappointing because you and the, what what's frustrating about it is you spend the year and you go through these cycles of things that you can expect you know okay it's getting to be this time of year we can expect to start seeing this stuff and in general you know those things come through for you and when you have one that you're like looking forward to that transition that okay it's going to be fall i'm I'm excited about having the opportunity these redfish and, and you spend time and energy chasing them a little bit and it just doesn't come through for you and you're like yeah yeah it sucks so Big bummer it's been, yeah it's been like that but I did. So I, I fished, this was like two days ago, uh, I went to the beach and I'm looking for redfish and I'm like, okay, I'm going to catch some daggum redfish. You know, where are these fish been? And I caught two and I caught a slot and a bull, you know, didn't crush it, but from the beach, that's not a bad day. And, um, the slot redfish I caught was where I would have expected it to be as a slot, uh, was in the first trough of the beach where I'm generally just whiting fishing and I'm casting, no more than 15 yards from the beach. So it's a real short cast with light tackle uh, right before you get to that first little sandbar around Fort mm-hmm. Morgan. So it's real cl- very close to the beach, um, shallow water, you know, maybe waist deep at most. And it, it did what it should have done. I was catching a lot of whiting out of that same hole that I was fishing and then eventually caught a slot redfish is about right at 20 inches. So that, and that's, and Generally, like I said, you can expect to start seeing that kind of opportunity more Anywhere. frequently around, around September. Yeah, on any stretch of beach. Yeah, and didn't see that this year, but uh, that was encouraging. And then um, I saw several schools of the bull redfish, the uh, the coppers. You know, this the the mm. ones that are glowing in the water. I saw several. Most of them were hanging far off the beach, but this was again just a random stretch of beach, not any inlet pass jetty. So all these schools were hanging around pelicans diving you know fall you know what i mean like fall feeding frenzy of redfish and one of them did swing in close enough to the beach that i was able to see it was about 200 yards down the beach so you know i start hoofing it and (laughs) i'm able to get to them before they push back out and they were just feeding frenzy right on the beach i was able to get a lure in them and hook up on one and get it in uh, before they pushed back out. But they were hanging relatively close to the beach the whole time. If you really were ambitious, you know, I already had a lot of set rigs, so I didn't want to leave them. But if you're really ambitious, you probably could have hung with that school as mm-hmm. it moved down the beach and had multiple opportunities. Yeah. It, you know, if, if you were feeling frisky and wanted to get a good workout in, <laughs> you right. could have chased them and caught more. But yeah, call some more singles out of that school. Yeah, I believe you could have too. Usually yeah. whenever they're like that. It's funny you talk about, you know, the, cyc- the cyclicality is that a word the cycle of things it is now we just made it one <laughs> there you go the uh cyclicality of things um like this year i mean the past three years at least that i can remember ling you know ling really didn't show up like we had hoped for you know uh out you know even off of here off and out like off our anchorage and things like that man sure. this year the ling were just stupid thick it was so yep. much fun everybody and, uh my mom caught one no i'm just kidding yeah, yeah. like everybody their mom. Have. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so right. yeah so that's yeah, just another one of those things i mean why why do they stick around this year why do they show up so hard and they stuck around for months and months and months and months and months right so who knows on that but yeah Pompano, let's go back to that a little bit. What's been the ticket with those guys? What's the water cl- water clarity like? Um, it's kind of dusted up a little bit over here after mm-hmm. that local rain. Um, so what are you seeing over there on those guys, and what's been the ticket for Pompano? Yeah, I'd say we had a, a better than usual fall, a, a late summer fall for Pompano, and you know, th- just very consistent. You know, not what again, not not to the levels of what we see in the spring, but just realistically even today i mean they're still hanging around we still have a good shot at them the only thing that's hindering pompano and i and i've been pompano fishing several times here in in the past month or so and every time i've gone 
you I've caught them some some days it's been juveniles like uh, they've been not quite legal maybe 10 to 11 inches um uh, but I'm still catching legals too I mean if you spend the time and you're out there you can get you can get an Alabama limit uh r- relatively easy for the time of year uh, right. if, if that makes sense you know we're not does, we're not, yeah. not not talking spring but they they've been hanging around the only thing that's been a hindrance and I don't know I don't know if I've talked about this much the last time I've been here or if any of the other surf fishing reports have mentioned this, but this year, one of those cyclical things for the dadgum uh, grass. And when I say grass, I'm going to, I'm going to put in parentheses, uh, we're talking all of it. So we're talking June grass, we're talking sargasm, we're talking spaghetti grass, we're talking whatever the heck ever other kind of grass comes through here that I don't even know what to call it. Yeah. And it's been the worst year in our surf. We still have grass in our surf right now. And right now we still have the sargasm. I'm not seeing as much of the June grass, but it's November. And we still, it's just really weird. Like I was, again, you know, this is jump back over uh, today. As a matter of fact, I fished in Navarre, just bringing it up because there was June grass in the surf while I was fishing the pier in Navarre in the middle of November. So it's just, it's one of those weird things. It's like, what the heck? You know, right. you, you generally we start to see less and less of that, but it's still hanging around. And and that's even more difficult to work with when we get like we've got these wind system, this wind picking up over the last few days, rough surf in conjunction with the grass. It's very difficult to surf fish and set rig surf fish for Pompano. Mm-hmm. And so that's your biggest challenge is dealing with the dad gum grass i can't tell you how many times i've recently just mumbled under my breath while i'm out there on the beach by myself man i'm tired of grass man i'm tired of grass like i just (laughs) i'm just so over it man i don't know and people listening that surfish on a regular basis around here know it'll be like amen man amen you know they they'll, they'll understand i just don't know why we have dealt with it so bad this year i mean it, and again for as far as the ecosystem and everything i think it's a positive like fish like it i don't think it's i mean it's great for life you know, so, that, right yes like it's a positive thing this is not this is not like the world is ending this is a good thing it's just a frustration as an angler <laughs> to sure. try to insert yourself in the ecosystem when these things take place so again it's it, you feel uh it's one of those entitled things that we we shouldn't feel entitled about. You know, this is not our habitat, but we're like, oh, you know, Dad Gummit, it's it's messing things up. So anyway, I I digress. But the grass has been difficult. <laughs> yeah. No, we talked to uh Bearded Brad last week and he was he was talking about the same thing. I think that was last week. But yeah, he was talking about the same thing, just the grass being everywhere. And the stuff that he's battling with now, it sounds like is that uh Richard said the scientific word for it. Richter was a scientist last week. You got to listen okay. to the show last right. week. Oh yeah, Richard the on. scientist. Is he that wanted... his? Is that his nickname now? <laughs> needs to be. He was talking about the that clear stuff that kind of suspends in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was talking about Brad was dealing with that a lot last week too. So yeah, I don't know, man. What's making that stuff hang around or not push out to where it's supposed to be? Or like you say, it's not really our world anyway. So there's no telling. Yeah, and it could be because it, pick your poison. You know, it could be because we have had a very low uh activity with the tropics for our area this year you know in years past we generally have you know at least a few systems that kind of come through and reset things kind of yeah and we haven't had that i mean even maybe a couple of the systems that did were extremely weak you know no more than uh, a, a windy Tuesday kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like we just right. didn't have anything yeah. that no, no disturbances that, to stir things. No. So I'm maybe not whine be, about that. I'll take a no, look. I, I will take the grass <laughs> <laughs> any day of the week, but yeah. it is still frustrating, but that could be it. We just haven't had anything to clean it up. So yeah. Agreed, man. Well, that still sounds pretty good. I mean, a few reds here and there, hopefully some more of those guys will start showing up. I mean, I know it's kind of Dixie bar time. Yep. Sounds like you just need to go West young man. <laughs> yes yeah and i've been spending some time uh, around dixie bar again and that's like i mentioned earlier you yeah, know not an issue morning. there necessarily you can they're pretty consistent there and yeah. uh we've still had some really good days out there for redfish i just i i like to look at surf because that's just like one spot you know and it, mm-hmm. and honestly it's not even in my opinion i kind of exclude it from surf fishing in my mind I, I take surf fishing as you know you can walk out on any 
given stretch of beach and set up lines and what opportunities do you have? You know, if we talk about redfish and how great the bite is, and it's that literally just that one spot, that's kind of disappointing for people that are fishing behind their condo. So sure. I, I, I like to kind of make that point, you know, or even around the jetties. Like if you fish around the jetties or the, any kind of pass, yeah, that's a little different. It, that's a spot. It's different. That's right. It's different, you know, and, and, and that, uh, ecosystem and their opportunities there are completely different than any anybody setting up on any random stretch of beach which is generally when i'm on here that's that's what i'm going to talk about you know yeah. what am i saying because that's most of the fishing that i do is i like to there's something rewarding for me to set up on just like this random stretch of beach like the you're like why would there even be any fish here and have an opportunity to catch a fish so yeah and have some success that's right. And that's probably what most of our listeners, I think, do probably. And I'm sure mm-hmm. there's some guys that chase the spots or, you know, go to go catch yeah. the bite at the spots. But what else, man? What else has been going on? Any jack? You been seeing any jacks? What else you what else you've been catching? No, I jacks have kind of died down. I'm not seeing as many. I know they're around in fall, you can catch them. And there's probably been some in some of these schools that I'm that I was referencing that I saw, I would imagine. I'm some sure. of those schools could have even been just jacks. I just, you know, they weren't swinging in close enough. So they're probably around. Um, I chased them. We had a great summer. I mean, a lot of I, I caught a lot of jacks. A lot of people caught a lot of jacks from the beach mm-hmm. this year. I know a lot of people that got their first jacks from the beach this year. You know, and again, this that's kind of one of those species that most people necessarily don't target, but it's becoming more and more of a thing. I would say just people recognizing the uh, sportiness of it and and the world world class quote unquote yeah. type fish that it can kind of can be if you relate it to like a GT for and sure. we, we have a great fishery for them here you know in in the state of Alabama and a very unique thing like if you go fish any pier on the North Gulf Coast you're rarely going to get a shot at 20 plus pound jack corvell sometimes like you can fish there all summer you may get one school that comes through one day and people get an opportunity but throughout the entire summer here on the alabama gulf coast at gulf state park pier you're going to have any given day of the week in the summer you're going to have three to eight schools of giant jacks come through like you know what i mean like it's a very unique thing to our area that i don't know if people realize how special it is and even in south florida they get frustrated with those jacks but they i i don't say i don't think that they even have that level of runs and blitzes from jacks like we do for whatever reason like i've spent enough time fishing and communicating with those guys and yeah they get a lot of opportunities at jacks but the way they act here and the way that they school up as often mm-hmm. as they do, it's very unique. So it's been a great year for that. And I, I think we should be proud of our Jack Cravel and not look down on them. I think we have a very cool fishery and cool opportunity right here on this stretch between here and Perdido. Uh, you, you know, it's just sure. it's a very and it's probably a lot to do with Mobile Bay is my guess. You know, I, I think Mobile think so. Bay probably drives that for whatever reason. Yeah. But moving down in size on fish, uh, we haven't talked about whiting, which, you know, for food source here, mm-hmm. I've had some really good whiting days, which that's fall. You know, we we get those these bigger average ca- size whiting that you can catch in the surf in the fall pretty consistently. And the last time that I went out, I caught on like a good average, like my average size was about 12 inches. A lot of them were between 10 and 14 inches. Which, you know, when you can get that average size 12 inch whiting out of 15, 20 fish, that's really good. Mm. And, you know, that's a great food source. And you can expect to see that. And the bite was great. And they were fun to catch. They're a lot of fun to catch. You know, I use light tackle for them. Sure. And it's a blast. I mean, I love the best part about surf fishing, set rig surf fishing, is watching that rod just, you know, lay over. And if you use, I use steelhead rods, which are just light action, long rods. And a 10 inch whiting will blow that thing over. And it's so much fun. I love it. Yeah. It's, I, I talked about it in my videos that I was filming and talking about that process and what I look for and all that this week. It's really my favorite style of set rig surf fishing because the action is fast. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot. I mean, you know, you catch a 14 inch whiting on my setups and they're going to be pulled on a little bit of drag and they're feisty and uh, they taste delicious. I mm-hmm. mean, you just, it gives you everything you want. You know, they're just a lot of fun. And I, I it never has gotten old for me targeting whiting with light tackle, especially when you can get the larger ones like you see in the fall. Yeah, so that, that that's been good. Yeah. So 
go get some whiting and uh you know cross your fingers for some redfish i guess <laughs> that's right well on the whiting man and they are delicious what's been the go-to bait for i think last week brad was saying that ghost shrimp was definitely the way to go for the most part this time of year uh what's been the ticket for whiting and then pompano yeah I, i've been using some some ghost shrimp and this time of year for pompano i, I would definitely agree with brad like you can, of course, still catch them on other stuff, but they're a little trickier this time of year in that they're, you know, it's it's not the spring, it's not their spawn. When they're spawning and these fish are just thick and hardy and healthy, you can almost it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be as strategic. Like they're gonna hit whatever the heck you throw out there. Yeah, sometimes in the spring you'll see some patterns or maybe you just feel like they are like yeah they're kind of keying in on something and maybe but in for the most part in the spring in the spring they're just hungry and and aggressive and fired up but in the fall that there's less of that you know we're not seeing as as many of the big breeder fish the big fat fish you know most your average fish a good fish in the in the late fall you know late summer and into fall is a 15 inch pompano like total length 15 inches that's a really good fish and that's a lot of what you catch and those fish are just not gonna eat whatever a lot of the time especially on a clear water day so definitely if you have the capability of getting ghost shrimp i would it's worth it to spend the time to get them and and use that bait but for the whiting do i go ahead on the pompano you scaling down no floats going straight going as little as possible or what's your tactic this time of year I would say like this time of year, no, you can still use, I've used a lot of the floats and stuff. I, I scale down more so like when I've moved east, just because our water, a clear water day for us is still like a little green, you know, it's not, it's not that crystal blue water, yeah. you know, I mean, if you get those days, yeah, you know, if you get that random day and especially right now, if we're talking like in the immediate you probably want the floats and the colors and things because it's really turned up. It's it's kind of milky out there. You want something just to catch their attention. That's all you're right. looking for. You know, if you think about Pompano, a lot of people target them, especially the commercial fishermen, they target them with jigs and they're flashy and they're moving around real fast and it's just to get their attention. And you want your Pompano rig out there in the water, especially if it's rough and a little dingy, that's what you're using that color for because it's just they're so there's so keyed in on sight you need that but it can be in your disadvantage in that clear water because they are so keyed in on sight they can see things and be like what you know that looks weird <laughs> you know what I mean? but yeah sure. um, but if, if it's a little dingy you need it just to get their attention and get them to come come feed so i would say no you can keep keep those on there that's fine unless you're moving a little further east and you do get in some like just crystal crystal clear water uh but for the whiting I always, anytime I'm whiting fishing, a hundred percent of the time, I'm using just pieces of dead shrimp, you know, just yeah. tiny hundred percent of the time. I'm not going to even bother with ghost shrimp. I'm not going to bother with sand fleas. I don't bother with any synthetic. It's always tiny pieces of shrimp because they always eat it. Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like the whiting, if they're there, they eat that. Even though like when you clean these, whiting what's going to be in their belly is a ton of sand fleas despite that fact i've i can't tell you how many times i've compared i'll have two setups and i'll have little tiny sand fleas on one that would be you know the size that a whiting would eat and little tiny pieces of shrimp and it's like four to one every time the shrimp so i just always use shrimp i don't even bother with it, anything else and for those rigs i just use just a tiny bead. I'll, I'll always do that. Sometimes I'll take the bead off if it's kind of clear water, but nine times out of 10, I just have a bead that's orange or pink on a single drop rig with 10 pound mono or fluoro and a size two circle hook with a piece of shrimp. You can't go wrong. The only thing I will say, if it's for whiting, the only big change that I make is if the water is very clean and you're having a, it's a very tough bite, They'll still hit the shrimp, little pieces of shrimp. That's all you need. But you may have to switch to a Carolina rig. I've seen that work several times. Like for whatever reason, if you kind of know they're there, or if you're seeing them, and you're, but you're using the standard dropper rig and you're not getting the eats, 
switch to a Carolina rig and that presentation, leaving it directly on the bottom for whatever reason, will generally get them to eat. So that's the only change I ever make with my in my style for whiting fishing. That's those two things. That's all you need to know. You know, it's like the most simplest fishing uh, yeah. to catch the suckers. That's awesome, man. Those are some great tips. What about what's your best way to uh, cook? Your favorite way to eat whiting? You know, whiting is such a great fish. You can do so much with it. My number one is to fry. I mean, you cannot beat a just a, a handful of whiting. I mean, they fillet up and they make like perfect little chicken strips. You, you know what I mean? Like if you go to any <laughs> uh, Zaxby's or or any or Fusaclis or whatever, and you get chicken strips, and but like the size of a whiting fillet fried up is like the perfect little chicken strip, and, and it's just so freaking delicious. Now. I don't fry a lot of fish just be, even though it's my favorite way to eat fish. It's not the healthiest. So I try to limit the amount of times I fry fish. So we, we generally like, we actually ate some this week, this past week. And all I did is I put salt and pepper on it and I put butter in a skillet, just a little bit of butter, not too much, but a little bit of butter and just got it, cooked it till it was a little bit brown on each side. And it was absolutely delicious. I mean, it's it's such a good fish. You can bake it too. Like baked whiting is is awesome. It's amazing. The only way I, I've never done it is grilled, just because yeah. it's it's a smaller fish and you know, interesting. Yeah, but baked, pan seared, fried, you can't go wrong. But fried is is definitely number one. Number one. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Well, those are some great tips, man. Sounds like things are. Uh... Still pretty good in the surf, even though they may not be, you know, perfect in spring, but it's not spring. You know what I mean? So <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Oh, man, that's that an one. awesome report. We uh, always enjoy hearing from you. If folks want to follow you on all the socials, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, to, uh, anywhere you go on the internet, that's a social media site, except for maybe OnlyFans. You can type in Bamba Beach Bum, <laughs> <laughs> and it'll pull me up. <laughs> Bamba that's the only one I'm not on. That's, That's it. right. Yeah, let's stay off of that one. <laughs> well, man, we always uh, always enjoy hearing from you and keep us posted, man. Can't wait to hear from you next time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right, buddy. All right. It's always good to hear from the Bama Beach Bum. You guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. With durability and convenience in mind, MB Ranch King's maintenance-free blinds are constructed with high-grade steel and come in a variety of sizes to meet any hunter's needs. They offer high-quality, easy-to-use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection and also brought to you by Test Calibration. If your diesel has low power or is consuming excessive amounts of fuel, these are common signs that your turbocharger may need to be rebuilt. Don't waste your money online with the cheapest options where you get no support after the sale. Test Calibration has been selling and servicing diesel, turbochargers, and fuel injection systems since 1976. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, Test Calibration can help you. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. All right, let's head on down and get our inshore report of the week. I'm going to talk to Captain Bobby Abrascado, Marshall of the Mississippi Sound, the man, the myth, the legend. Welcome back to the show, Cap. Man, glad to be on, and I'm glad to be here with a good report for you, dog. I mean, it's always nice when we uh, we uh, have a good report to offer, and I got a good one for you, man, with catching fish, uh, plenty of fish, uh, some nice size fish, and some different techniques, so... um yeah, I got a I got a good one for you, man. I'm even going to give you some good pictures to go along with it. Awesome, awesome. I can't wait. I love a good report. What's been the deal? What you been chasing? You've been chasing speckled trout, the usual. What's been going on? Oh, you know me. I'm going to be I'm going to be chasing my trout as much as I love catching redfish and other species. I'm always after those trout, you know. And so when my clients ask me what they're going for, I say, well, my target species is always speckled trout. We're liable to catch other stuff. And man, it's been good. I've been catching a lot of fish uh, targeting the river, uh, you know, the river systems. And um, you know, there's still so many shrimp left in the rivers. Uh, we just haven't had the cold weather to get the shrimp out of the rivers. And so you got to you got to kind of just still do that shrimp type fishing and when when those you know rivers are loaded with shrimp you know it, it th those fish are so hard pressed it's so hard pressed to get them to hit anything other than the shrimp imitation that being a you know a gulp shrimp or a voodoo shrimp under a cork or a, or a grub 
you know, presented as a shrimp, which is basically jigging it on the bottom. And that's how I've been catching uh, my fish. But I uh, want to talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk a little bit too. Had a chance to, uh, like you and I were talking about before we got on the air, about doing some neat stuff with the uh, Slick Junior too. So I had an opportunity uh, with some guys that, you know, that were, were willing to forego some numbers, uh, target some quality fish, and we put those on and did really well. But, uh, you know, the key thing is right now, and it's going to be this way, Butch, for a little while to where when these shrimp are loaded in these rivers, you're going to have to start drifting the ledges and even the flats on the warmer days with those shrimp imitations and start, you know, fishing them basically like you do the, the uh, and we are, we're in a fall kind of a still kind of towards that transitional deal, but this fall deal to where these fish are, uh, you know, gathering up, following these these uh, swarms of shrimp, and um, you just drift along with them uh, until you find, you know, school and either hit your power pole if it's shallow enough or your spotlight and your trolling motor and fish them like school fish. And that's what's been working for me. And, um, you know, I, I love, I, you know, you know me, man. I love catching them any way I can catch them. Uh, love catching them on top water, being fancy like that. Love catching them on slicks. But, man, when they want those shrimp, that's what you got to give them. So if you're one of the people that likes to throw those bigger swim baits and stuff, you can go out and throw it. You're going to get a lot of bites. I mean, you're not going to get many bites, but the ones you catch are going to be nice. But if you really want to get some fish in the boat, you know, for a little while longer, at least you're going to have to throw those those shrimp imitations. And then with that, too, uh, and, you know, again, the pictures that we'll, we'll get up there, um, we're – you know, I'm, I'm on a string of about three weeks straight of trips of triple digit numbers of fish wow. with obviously lots of small fish making up those numbers. But in that, we're catching, you know, two and a half to four pound trout, you know, the occasional redfish mixed in with them because all those fish, both the small ones, and the bigger ones are feeding on those shrimp. You know, a guy told me one time, I'll never forget it, this guy that I li- listened to a seminar he did and he was talking about catching trophy trout. And he uh, he used a lot of shrimp imitations to catch really big trout. He said, you know, when those big trout are eating croakers and mullet and pogies, they're still eating a whole lot of shrimp. So you you still got the chance of catching real nice sized fish, even using shrimp imitations, particularly when there's a lot of shrimp in the water, which is what's going on right now. And that's not going to change until all these shrimp get out of here. And that's going to require a freeze pretty much to get them out of here. And that usually doesn't happen until, you know, at least late November. So that's going to be the deal, the way I see it, at least for at least for a few more weeks. Very cool, man. That's a good report. What's been giving these fish away for the most part? You know, we talk a lot about bird schools and stuff, which you mm-hmm. know happens a lot of times in the early part of the transition. The, the, and sl- fish slicks, obviously, too, more in the spring. You know, when they're feeding, they'll, they'll create slicks. But even now, when when there's a lot of shrimp in the water, particularly in some of the deeper applications. The birds know they're there, and you'll see a lot of times it won't necessarily be a flock of birds, a big tornado of gulls. It'll be a few birds hovering over an area, and every once in a while one of them will go down. And that, to me, is one of the things I've been really keying on because, you know, these shrimp and the fish with them are still moving up and down the river systems. And so, you know, even though the river might look small on paper, when you get a, when you get out there on a boat, you're going like, man, I've got to have some at least some kind of starting point. And that's yeah. one of the key things that I've been I've been looking for. The other thing is, too, our river systems here on both sides of the bay um, have bottom undulation. If you understand where – you know, the points and the bars that extend off some of the small points, visible point land. Uh, if you understand where that bottom, where the bar, you know, extends out from that, that's another thing that I've been really keying on. If some, if I don't have some kind of obvious, you know, sign from above, which is the birds, mm-hmm. you know, I'll start targeting, you know, the edges of the bars and the points where the points, it, because that that's kind of a feeding place for those fish where you get current running across a point or down a point or whatever it is. And that's a place that gathers bait, which of course is going to gather fish. So those are the two things that I've been keying on any place that gathers that bait, you know, until something else gives them away. And then the other thing, going back to what I mentioned earlier, is usually I'll move around a lot, I, you know, never throw an anchor out, but I do spot lock or power pole down a lot uh, and move around a lot until I find something, you know? So a lot of times it requires a little, drifting or trolling around until you hit on something but those, those are the three ways that i've been finding them here lately and, and it's just typical fall you know i, I call it mid fall fishing yeah it's definitely uh man it feels a little bit a little bit more like fall today luckily i think we're going to get some pretty decent temperatures this weekend that will lower that water temperature 
It will. And, and what we needed to do, too, is not only lower, like you just said, because we're going to get some 30-degree, yeah. you know, mid-30-degree weather. In the wa- but the water temperature, we don't remember a few weeks ago, we had mid-30 degrees, and it dropped down in the, in the 60s. Well, it's already come back up. You know, for the last couple of weeks, it's been back up in the low 70s. So you've had like a six, seven, eight degree water temperature rise over a few weeks period. And that's a lot to fish. And so mm-hmm. I was explaining it to a guy that was a you know, pretty knowledgeable fisherman as far as like even just freshwater, saltwater. And he understood what I was talking about. When you start getting these these swings like this and these transitional periods, it confuses the heck out of those fish. And that's why these transitional periods get you know, it, we should have transitioned already, you know what I'm saying? But when you start getting these swings like this, it confuses the fish, which confuses the anglers, you know? So you gotta, you know, it, it gets <laughs> right. kind of, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's challenging in a fun way. It's, it's kind of fun to, to figure it out when you do get it figured out to me. It's, that's one of the exciting things, but you know, you get those kind of things where the water temperature on the way down, all of a sudden, boom, it starts going right back up, you know, and they, they kind of go like, and they react to that. You have to kind of figure that out, and that's kind of what's going on right now. But now we get this cold weather this weekend, you know, things will start settling into a true pattern. Um, and I, I th- I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. But, you know, even if it doesn't, the fish are staying there. They're, they're still going to eat. You just got to figure out how to catch them. That's right, and where they are. Yep. Man, talking about the Slick Junior a little more, you said you had some clients that had some success with it. Yeah, I've- we did. We had a couple a couple really good days uh, throwing those. Um we're fishing them uh, very similar to how I fish the uh, the big slick, the regular, the original slick. Fishing them on a one eighth and a one sixteenth ounce uh, swim bait hook, and um, and when we got, you know, it, it, what was exciting to me, a couple things is when I got the color right. In other words, you know, that's the cool. Another cool thing about that product is uh, not just the bit, you know, any of their their lures. But uh, is you can just change colors fairly quickly to, mm-hmm. to match the water color. And um, uh, when I started getting dialed in on the color, we were fishing some clear to clear tannic type water. And um, I got switched over to the cool beans and to the um, I, I keep wanting to call it the swamp monster, the swamp thing mm-hmm. uh, color. Um, those two colors really did well w- uh, for us. And um, you know, again, what I what I noticed was that you know when we started fishing it like we did the the big slick, the original slick, and swimming it, you know, more than hopping it like you gr- a grub is when we started doing really well with it, you know, and the guys figured that out, and um, and I got the colors dialed in right, and um, those two colors were working really well in that clear water deal. I uh, had fluorocarbon leader on braided line, and then I was throwing straight fluorocarbon, and that seemed to help a lot, lot too, because that was get, keeping that lure down. Mm-hmm. You know, with the 16th ounce weight, it was still wanting to come up a little bit too high, in the water so you know the eighth ended up working better and it could have been the fact that we caught them a little later in the morning when the sun was up and the fish were maybe a little further down in the water column in that clear water but you know one of the things i'm starting to lean towards is is a smaller hook with that and still go in our fishery at least anyway still going to a little bit heavier weight to keep that thing down just a little bit you know so mm-hmm. anyway we're still working on the hook thing but it, it, i can tell you this you get it right those fish eat it up I'm going to send you some pictures that uh, hopefully we'll get up there where these guys really caught some nice fish using those things for the first time they'd ever used them, you know? So yeah, that's it encouraging. Was, and it was a new deal for me too, you know? Yeah. That's very encouraging that, you know, new folks can pick it up with no problem and put the hammer down. Yep. That's right. And you know, and again, it's, you know, even with the original slick, as much as I'm sold on that lure, you know, it's, it's like, I tell everybody, if, you know, if you don't use dynamite correctly, you won't get fish. Right. That's <laughs> you right. Know, if you, you can throw dynamite around with, there's no fish around and you're not going to catch it. You're not going right. to get any, you know what I'm saying? So, yep. so you got to use it in the right, use it right, use it in the right application. You can't just go out there and just throw it in the water and expect it to, uh, to work. But it, I can tell you this, it's, uh, it's, it works really well when applied properly. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, a the age old adage with the uh you know the original slick was you know we did a whole bunch of videos of you working it and patrick working it and uh richard working it whenever you gave it to your clients and i know it's new to you too um you said you were using the swim bait to keep it up a little bit not really hopping it on the bottom like a grub which is pretty much the only experience that i have with it flounder fishing which did great by the way how were you explaining to them to work it if that makes any sense how did you kind of uh you know educate them 
the the first thing I ask a guy, particularly if he's got saltwater experience, is he's, and we all grew up fishing mirror lures. To, or you right. know, I say we all. A lot of us did when I was growing up. You know, uh, still growing up, but uh, you know, learning <laughs> right. the trout. You're fish, not growing you know, up mirror yet. Mirror lures. The, and I still got a lot of. I still have a lot of mirror lures. Unfortunately, when the slick came out, all my mirror lures now have rusty hooks on them. So I don't use them anymore. But uh, what I usually ask people is, Have you ever fished a mirror lure? Oh yeah, I use them all the time. Fish just like a mirror lure. Hmm. And what I do is, and everybody fishes those different, you know, and I've found that there's not, like you were just talking about, the way us three work those are completely different. And we all catch fish on them. So I don't know if there's a right or a wrong way to do it. So my first thing is, have you ever used a mirror lure? Yeah. Fish it like you fish a mirror lure. That's the first thing I tell them. And usually they'll start catching fish. And then sometimes I'll notice a guy doing something maybe a little too fast mm-hmm. or maybe a little too slow or something. And I may, may give them a little tip on that. But, you know, it's, you know, I, I've had guys get in the boat. Or I'll, if it's a freshwater fisherman, a guy's got bass experience, I'll say, if you're a fish, you fish swim baits, yeah. Fish it like you fish your swim bait. Let's go from there, you know. Yep. And oftentimes they start catching fish with it, you know. So it's just such a – it tells you it's a good lure because it can be worked so many different ways, you Very know? Versatile. So that's usually yeah. what I tell them. And that's exactly what I've done so far with the slick junior. I said, guys, this is brand new. This, you know, we're kind of like the first kids on the block with this thing. And I said, I don't know what's right or wrong with the thing. Probably the biggest thing I can, I could say right now is you might have to slow it down a little bit more because the lure being a little bit smaller needs to stay down just a little bit. At least what I'm fishing right now, which is a lot of, four to seven feet of water you know and the fish that i'm catching even when i'm fishing my uh, my shrimp imitations under a cork i've got them sit deeper than I normally do just because of the of where i'm fishing you know the, the water level the depths that i'm fishing when we start fishing in the spring getting out there in the water you know wading with them i don't think that's going to be the issue i think you'll be able to fish you know fish it a little faster keep it a little higher in the water but where i'm at right now the big thing i'm telling them is just you know, give yourself a little pause to let that lure get back down before you start working it again. Man, that's great advice. Those are some really great tips for the Slick Junior. And that was the exact, I, I didn't know what you were going to say, but I knew you had something to, you know, kind of compare it to, to give them an example, you know, kind of like the mirror lure thing and the swim bait thing for the uh, the bass guy. That's exactly what I was looking for. I think that'll give our listeners some great direction. At least, at least get started that way, and then you can play around with it from there. Speed it up, slow it down, work in your pauses and that sort of thing. But at least, you know, with with nothing else to say, that's 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 what I do. Yeah, that's a good template. I agree. That, that definitely makes sense to me. Well, man, that's a great report. I can't wait to uh, see those pictures. Um, I was kind of looking at the weather here. It's not going to get that cold. I thought it was going to get a little colder. Um, we're still talking about highs in the 60s. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm very, I'm very happy about that. I'm <laughs> looking forward to some 40s. But I, mean, yeah. I think, do you anticipate it changing anything through the weekend? Or are we going to have to have some pretty solid temperatures be before we see changes? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it won't be through the weekend for sure. Yeah, it won't be through the weekend. It's going to have to get down and stay down for a number of days. The other thing that's happening too is is uh, we're getting shorter days now. It's less sun on the water and in a the, the different sun angle, and that always brings water temperature down. You're a deer hunter. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. So you got less less sun angle or less sun on the water and a different angle on the water. So that's going to allow it to drop some too. But as far as like to, to your original question, no, it's not going to change. So whatever you were doing, Last weekend, if you're fishing over the weekends, you're going to be able to do it this weekend, too. Even though it's going to feel colder to you, it's not going to drop the water temperature enough to change anything. Yeah, perfect. That's what I was getting at. Man, that's a great report. We appreciate the tips, as always. If folks want to get up with you guys and book a trip and get in on some of this fall and winter fishing, man, what's the best way to get in touch with you? A-Team Fishing is uh, the best way to do it. It's got our uh, co- our contact us uh, tab, has our uh, phone number and our email address. You can email us and um, get you set up. Um, I got some days. I got some days left in November. I got still got several left in December. And, you know, we were just talking about the cold weather. You know, if you really want to get into some, you know, good late fall and winter fishing, that's to me, after that first freeze is when it really gets good. That's when you start throwing, you know, we get all these shrimp out of here. That's when you can get on there and get on these uh, slick lures, both the big one and the and the uh, slick junior and those type of lures, topwater lures. I had a fellow just dying to catch one on the top water. But anyway, that's when that all really starts happening. We tend to rush a little bit thinking, oh, it's fall. Let's just automatically go topwater fishing. <laughs> it ain't quite like that when, right. when you got a million shrimp still in the water. So 
anyway, uh, don't don't pass on that you know, standard report, that's for sure. Yeah, man, that's great. We look forward to hearing from you next time, and be safe out there, buddy. Okay, Butch, thanks for having me on. All right, it's always good to hear from the Marshall of the Mississippi Sound, Captain Bobby Aberscato with 18 Fishing Adventures. You guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator. The days of heading out and blindly looking for good fishing areas are pretty much over. Don't waste time and money on fuel searching for fish. You need the most recent, highest resolution images to not only know where to go, but where not to go. The knowledge provided by today's technology is critical when planning an offshore fishing trip. Make the choice that professional captains all over the Gulf make and choose Hilton's Real-Time Navigator. The easy-to-use interface and excellent customer service will have you on the fish every time you go. Check them out at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. For over 20 years, Fish Bites has been helping anglers all along the Gulf Coast and around the world put fish in the cooler. Ask for Fish Bites or Fish Bites Fight Club lures or visit fishbites.com. Fish Bites, made in the USA. All right, guys, before we jump into our next segment, we're going to go talk to my buddy Joe over at the Northwest Florida Fishing Report. Got a really cool uh, segment this week. It's kind of a way to offset your, maybe your boat note a little bit and make some money. What's going on, Butch? Oh, man, not a whole lot, buddy. How are you over there? I'm doing great, man. I, uh, I'm looking forward to today's conversation because the thought of renting my boat is enticing from an income perspective, but it is also, I, I'm having anxiety just saying that. Uh, thinking about some right. of the y- right. yahoos somebody I've else is going to be driving my boat right well yeah if you want <laughs> right. to call it that but uh we're going to learn what is possible in terms of income we're going to find out how you can stay protected if you can stay protected if you decide to rent your boat and just really kind of feel out if this is a good option and the right move for you and to do that today we've got luke Campbell and Jason Samine of Boat Setter joining us. Guys, welcome to the podcast. I mean, when I think about renting my boat, the main advantage I think about is the added income and what is possible in terms of that. Uh, There's some potential downsides I can see right off the bat too. We're going to talk about those as well today. But before we, you know, get into kind of dealing with those downsides, first off, tell us a little bit about yourselves, a little bit about Boat Setter. Uh, and then why we need to maybe consider renting a boat. Yeah, thank you guys for having us on. We're uh, appreciative of the opportunity. And I am Luke Campbell. I'm Director of Fishing Experiences here at Boat Setter. I've been with the company for about two years now and uh, came over to help launch our fishing vertical and fishing team. And uh, we worked on it uh, behind the scenes, getting it prepared for launch um, and then launched a fishing uh, vertical within Boat Setter last uh, spring. And uh, we've been growing the the fishing side of the platform since then and uh, brought on Captain Jason here as well uh, to join this spring. Very cool. Jason, you're out of Tampa? I am. Yes. Uh, thanks for having me again. Yeah. Like Luke said, I, I came on, um, this spring with boat setter and, um, on here as the operations manager, just kind of oversee the, the day-to-day, um, dealings with the fishing charters and captains that we have coming on. And then some of our owners that run their boats. Very cool. Well, like I mentioned, you know, added income is the main draw. I would think for most people, what's possible in terms of that? Like, well, give me a range, like potential here in terms of uh, income generation for somebody renting their boat. Yeah, so a range is a good way to describe it because uh, there's certainly a range of opportunities in terms of you could uh, use boat setter just to take advantage of the days when your boat's not being used and say, try to offset the costs of owning and maintaining the boat and do say one to two bookings a month, uh, earn a few hundred dollars per month, and you could do it seasonally or year round, depending on the market you're in. Uh, and then the next kind of level up from there would be being someone who's uh, looking at this as not only offsetting their costs of owning a boat, but earning supplemental income and, uh, you know, putting a little more time commitment into uh, using boat setter and, aiming for a few bookings um, a week and uh, really trying to take advantage of the weekends, especially. And that could be earning thousands of dollars a month um, up to the level of someone who treats this as their full-time job and uh, either already has a boat rental uh, business or a charter business and is using Boat Setter to uh, supplement their demand up to people who uh, start out on Boat Setter 
using it as a way to make supplemental income and then actually grow a business out of it and find that from listing one boat, it gives them the opportunity to uh, earn income that allows them to purchase more boats, start employing a boat manager and potentially captains even. Um, because we've seen people who, when we started Boat Setter in the mid 2010s, um, it started out as a way for really people to offset the, the cost of boating um, and just earn a little supplemental income. And then since then, there have been a lot of owners across the country who have really turned this into their full-time business and been able to kind of live out their dream job of working on the water and reporting to themselves and being their own boss. Uh, so we do have people who are um, earning over $100,000 a year through renting their boat out through Boat Setter. And then we've got the people who, you know, they're using their boat for personal use and they're renting out through Boat Setter and earning, say, you know, a few hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars a month and, you know, benefiting from that as just some extra residual income. It's a very cool idea, man. I was down in the Keys a couple, three weeks ago. My wife and I went down there for an anniversary trip and I was like, man, it'd be cool to drive something like super dope when I was down here. So I was got, I got on the Toro app and was playing around with it. I mean, it's essentially the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Am I wrong on that? No, that's exactly right. Uh, and we get a lot of owners who have an Airbnb or Verbo uh, or are on Turo. Um, so there's definitely a lot of crossover between that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very similar in terms of we have an app. Uh, you can search by location, find all types of boats, you know, from say dope center consoles um, to smaller bay boats, skiffs, pontoons. Uh, and you can even book captain charters on say like a yacht and kind of ball out go to the sandbar or like for book sure. a book something for a bachelor or a bachelorette party and and of course fishing charters which uh yeah we've been been growing in the last year or so i hadn't even considered pivoting this into trying to buy a new boat this is a great idea i need to let my right. wife listen it's to this gonna one. be just like the old rental property game right you That's gotta right. have like you have like three rental properties and you get so they pay for the fourth one and you That's live right one. yeah so you just need four boats but and then you get one for free perfect i'm in Speaking exactly. of that, guys, I mean, you know, you're talking about this range and that's interesting, you know, that you got people from just casually using it to maybe just, you know, help them pick up a bill here or there to people that are actually using this like a business. It, it sounds like it's pretty possible for a boat to pay for itself through renting. Is that is that feasible for somebody to rent a boat enough to, you know, pay the note on a boat and still actually be able to use the boat themselves? Yeah, the two things that we would say are kind of the biggest determinants of success um, are A, your motivation and having a bit of an entrepreneurial mindset to how you're treating listing your boat on Boat Setter. Um, you know, it is something that you are going to have to commit some time to um, in terms of a little, you know, extra maintenance um, in terms of, you know, managing bookings, uh, just as if you would be, you know, listing an Airbnb or listing your car on Turo for rentals. And, you know, it requires thinking with a business mindset in terms of, hey, are there, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, you're going to have to sell people on unconverting bookings and you're going to need to look at your prices. Um, you're going to need to keep your boat clean um, and do things to just ensure a five star experience when you do have people renting your boat. So motivation and mindset are key. And then the market that you're in is also a factor. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, as as you you know could imagine being in location, a, location, yeah, location. Exactly, a place that's warm, you know, year round is going to give you opportunity year round. Um, and you know, even whether you're located on the water with a marina slip or um or a private uh dock at a residence, uh, you know, that can help. But even if you're inland, um, but can accommodate for renters uh to give them the flexibility of say delivering your boat to different locations um, or allowing them to trailer it to different locations um, that can, you know, just give you more opportunities to get your boat booked. Um, and so thinking about it with that sort of like mindset in terms of how can I uh, best make my boat available and, and compelling to people to want to book even to, you know, thinking about, Hey, what are some extras I could provide fishing gear for rent with my boat as an add-on option um, or, you know, can I provide a cooler because someone's coming in from out of town and, you know, might not have their own. Just thinking of in terms of those things uh, definitely helps people have more success. That's really smart to be able to look at, you know, say 
a market that's near you and there's more demand in that market and you making your boat accessible to that market, you know, you're talking about the sandbar example. I mean, right here in Destin, you got Crab Island and then look, people love to go out to Crab Island and hang out all day. And, but if you got your boat in Navarre, uh, that's a decent little haul. You'd have to kind of make sure it was available to those people over there. Is there a way for boat owners to assess a market and determine if, Hey, this is going to be, there's going to be enough demand here to make it worthwhile for me to do that? I mean, do you have tools online or, or you, do you help people kind of determine if like, is this viable? Yeah, that's a great question. So from, you know, taking the first step, if you're someone who is not already, you know, starting to list a boat within Boat Setter, if you just go to our website um, or download the app and search your location and see, you know, what types of boats are listed in the market about how many That's a boats, good idea. Yeah. And especially, you know, you can filter the results to where you can select like center consoles only or pontoons or filter it to like boats between 20 and 30 feet. And so you can see what's a boat similar to mine look like and see, and then look at like the number of reviews for different boats is what we recommend. You know, not every booking gets a review. So you could look at the number of views and maybe, you know, double or like think of that as, okay, maybe this is, you know, 50 to 75% of the bookings, but you can start to get a range of like, yeah, just check out the competition basically and kind of compare just like anything else, check the reviews, look at the reviews, look at the action kind of. Yeah. hundred percent. And then the kind of next stage would be if you start to list your boat. Um, and if you set up a listing, we do have a smart boat pricing feature, which helps, the owners uh, set a price that will be competitive in their market. And so we actually built that out and launched it this summer where it factors in the boat um, age, the location and boat characteristics. And so it'll give you a, you know, real time or a constantly adjusting um, recommended rate. Um, so it's going to adjust when the season changes, when they're, you know, local um, impacts on demand and it'll give you a recommended rate to kind of keep your boat in a in a competitive price range um, that we recommend but then on the other hand you can also customize your price on your own um, and you can slide it up slide it down via a price slider tool we have in order to take advantage of peak demand on say like july 4th weekend labor day weekend right um, things like that and so yeah we try to we're always trying to um Think of more tools that can be helpful for owners uh, once they are listing on Boat Setter. But certainly, uh, if you're, you know, looking at it as um, someone who is just trying to consider the opportunity, definitely do a, do a, a search on the platform. But the one thing I'd say too is, you know, if there aren't many boats in your area yet, uh, that doesn't mean that we're not invested in in that market as one to grow, uh, where we are going to be expanding a lot. Uh, over this next year, um, and both sort of recently raised uh, more fundraising uh, to be able to help with that. And so there is an opportunity too, where if your market's not necessarily developed on both sort of yet, it could be a time to get in kind of first. Get it on the ground floor. Yeah. Early mover advantage. Yeah, right? yeah, yep, yeah, for sure. Well, man, you know, uh, when I think about the money, that's exciting, you know, and especially if you think about regardless of what your goals are, if you're just trying to defray some costs or you're trying to turn this into a business it sounds like the, the possibilities are there but when i started thinking about renting a boat and i'm kind of like all right i don't know if i want anybody on my boat you know like it kind of kind of worries me a little bit so what are the potential downsides of renting your boat and then how do you address those concerns that people are going to have undoubtedly i mean they're going to be worried about what happens if susie takes it out on the sandbar and runs into another boat yeah, that's the most common question uh, that we get probably from uh, prospective owners. And so to kind of address that concern, Boat Setter formed a partnership with Geico Marine and Boat US, and we actually formed the first and only of its kind insurance policy for peer-to-peer -peer boat rentals. And so that means that when your boat is being rented through Boat Setter, it's covered for the duration of the rental. And if any damage does occur, uh, you can file a claim and get reimbursed uh, for that damage. And then we also hold a security deposit on rentals. So if there's like smaller incidental damage or like say like a life jacket gets lost or there's damage to say like some fishing gear, 
we can also get you reimbursed by charging that security deposit and get you a, a quicker reimbursement without needing to file a claim uh, with the insurance. And the two, I'd say like two, I mean, main benefits of um, the way the insurance policy is set up uh, for just convenience um, and affordability is A, there's no out-of-pocket costs um, to the owner. So that basically the fee that will cover the insurance is factored into the rental uh, that the renter is paying for. So you can list your boat on Boat Setter for free, get it set up. You're not having to apply or pay for any new um, insurance policy. And related to that, there's no separate application uh, for getting approved for this insurance program. It's actually built into the listing process where when you're listing your boat on Boat Setter, you're going to need to upload photos of the boat and put in characteristics about your boat just so we can market it. And so your listing can be built out to show renters what they'll be booking. And Geico Marine Boat US, take that information that you're uploading just to describe your boat, show it. And they're determining um, just to make sure that it's rentable, safe, um, and approved for the policy. So it's a seamless process. And like I said, uh, you know, importantly, doesn't cost you as an owner anything to, to get set up on. Man, that's incredible. And the one other thing uh, I would say too, in terms of addressing concerns over, you know, someone potentially being unqualified to to rent and operate a boat is we also have U.S. Coast Guard Captain Network as part of our platform uh, to give people the option of booking captain rentals or, or captain charters as well. And uh, I'll actually let Jason speak to that as a captain himself. Yeah. So, so we do have Captain Network, about 1,700 qualified captains we have in a network all over the country. I personally have run, um, I'm a Coast Guard licensed captain. I've run charters for uh, Boat Setter. And I, I also have two boats on the platform myself. So I'm not only a, 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 a owner, I'm a client. So the, the peace of mind that comes from an owner that's kind of hesitant to begin with renting their boat on the platform is you know, having a captain there as, you know, maybe a designated driver in, in your Crab Island uh, example there sure. is, is very important, you know, to protect your asset because it is some, most of the time it is, you know, a family boat that maybe not is using. So we don't want to wreck it. So we do have that captain's network that owners can tap into. Um, and then we also uh, just to reiterate what Luke was saying, there is no costs and, the only thing that maybe might have some kind of monetary commitment on your end would be depending on the location, there might be a business license or county ordinance that if you're running a, you know, a, a charter business out of a marina or a boat ramp, you have to pay a fee. But outside of that, there's no out-of-pocket expense to lift your boat on Boat Setter. And then one final thing too, in terms of uh, addressing the concerns of, you know, is my boat going to be safely operated is uh, you as the owner have the final say over approving or declining bookings of your boat. And so what we recommend to owners is when you get rental requests to just ask the boating experience of the person who uh, will be renting your boat and just to vet that because, you know, you as an owner know your boat uh, better than Hopefully better than most uh, yeah, and can, sure. can assess that um, and, you know, asking about the experience of, of a person in terms of what vessels they've operated, but also, you know, if they're familiar with the area can certainly help you, you know, decide whether a person uh, will be safe uh, operating your boat. And then it can also just help you give them tips too, for like places to go, places to avoid and tips for your area if they are unfamiliar. So, you know, you talked about the insurance, for example, being included in the cost of the rental. When it comes to those other variable expenses, meaning the, the expenses that are occurring because the boat is being rented out, you know, take me through some of those types of costs and how those are, who pays for them, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, fuel. Kind of give me a rundown of what it's like for, and Jason, this probably be a good question for you. Give me a rundown of what it's like every day that you rent that boat and the costs that you experience on those days? Sure. So fuel is a, a good question. As, as the owner, you can choose whether fuel will be included in the, in the rate that you charge for the rental or whether the renter is going to pay the fuel. So if it's included, that's very easy. Boat comes back, you pick it up from the renter and, um, and the fuel is included. If not, 
the car that the renter uses to um, rent the boat, I, I would go to the gas station, fill it up, and then we would run the card for that amount. I get reimbursed with that amount uh, through Boat Setter. Um, so the so the fuels fuels covered in that way. Um, as far as just you know wear and tear, we get a lot of reluctant owners that say, "Well, the maintenance is going to go up on my boat, you know, because I'm renting it, and you know the resale value might go down because the engines are going to have more hours on it." Um, my my biggest thing as a boat owner, I owned a boat when I was 11 years old. As a boat owner, all these years, I have realized uh, there is a cost to not use your boat. And, and a lot of times, right right now, I'm looking in my driveway, I have an old Mako, and she hasn't moved, unfortunately, in a while because of football and softball and all the things on the weekend. So uh, there's going to be a time where I know I'm going to go out there and the switches aren't going to work or there's gonna, the battery might be down or, you know, if the, you don't turn over these old engines every once in a while, there's going to be some kind, maybe a cost down the road for not using it. So what Boat Setter also helps do is kind of lubricates all those things on boats that sit that wouldn't normally be used like switches lights you know the the engine itself so uh i i feel that if if i wanted to if it was just going to be my my main source of income then yeah you would get a boat you would you'd build all those those costs in just as if you were going to rent a car or start any other or a, a rental property you know that's going to happen if not you can regulate and just say you know i might only just want to do one or two trips a month just to kind of keep things moving. So I don't have to go out there on a Sunday and start the boat and flush it out just to get the engines moving. So there are added maintenance costs, but I think they would offset what, it, what would normally happen if you weren't to use the boat um, as much as you, you know, you would, if you're renting it out. And then real quickly too, with things that aren't necessarily going to be a necessity on every rental, uh, there are add-on options uh, when booking. So uh, say a renter wants fishing gear or ice, uh, you can charge for those types of things um, as well as just variable costs um, and set it per booking, per item, whatever way works best for you. And even for things like trailering or transporting the boat to a location, uh, you can make that an additional fee. So there's ways to basically pass those costs through um, on a rental. You mentioned that there is control over how much you charge and you do give uh, some guidance on what the market will bear for a boat that is similar to yours in, in your area. Thinking about what you're talking about, Jason, you know, like that is an advantage to me besides the monetary advantage is like getting the boat, getting somebody to run it. I mean, things happen and you get busy. And whenever we were playing on this show, that was one of the first things I told you, like, well, what, what do you think? Like, what, what is the advantage over money? I was like, keeping that thing moving, yeah. like, keeping it cranked up. I mean, like, yeah. just like Jason was saying, same thing. Um, that's the worst part about mine is sitting down there and watching her not, not go out. Keeping air in the trailer tires is big on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never yep. knowing when you're going to use that thing. You got to keep the trailer maintenance, you know, maintained. Yeah. That's yep. a good point you bring up, but uh, thinking about the, uh, how much you charge, what about how often you rent? And then, you know, does the, does the bone owner have the ability to say, all right, look, I'm planning to have the boys in town, you know, this week, and we're going to just block out the dates on the calendar. Uh, well in advance, I'm kind of, kind of, you know, kind of like you've got a vacation rental. You can say like, this, this is the week we're going to go vacation. I want to make sure nobody does rent it. Uh, is all that, that process pretty seamless? You know, can somebody just quickly get on and say, I don't want this thing rented on July 4th weekend. And, Cause I want to use it. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a boat setter owner app, uh, which makes managing your boat listing and your calendar uh, as easy as possible. So from there, you can block off specific dates. Uh, you can also block off months. And uh, you can also even just set your boat to inactive if you're not sure how long uh, your boat will be unavailable. So whenever like owners do need to, uh, you know, take their boat to the shop, like that's the feature they'll use well, where they'll just make it inactive so they can't receive new rental requests for the time being and then reactivate it uh, whenever it's back ready. But absolutely, you can block off, you know, Saturdays in advance or something uh, when you know you're going out with the boys or whatnot. So Jason, you, you were talking about you, your boat rents from a trailer most times, you know, thinking about your situation, Butch, you know, being on the water in a lift. Is it really, is there, is there any rules as far as that goes? Like, can somebody rent from their private residence? Do they have to be at a marina? Do they have to do it from a trailer? Is there anywhere that you can't rent a boat from? That's kind of localized. Uh, we, here in Tampa, we're pretty wide open. There are, there's a, just a handful of places where the, the city doesn't allow you to conduct business in that 
sense. But yeah, if you're comfortable enough, you know, having people come, come to your backyard and jump on the boat. Sure. I, I I've captained boats uh, for boats that are owners where I've walked in their backyard, got the boat off their lift for them, drove it, picked some people up at a local boat ramp, took them around the sandbars, dropped them off and brought the boat back and put it up on the lift. And the guy was in his backyard sipping iced tea the whole time and was making money. <laughs> so yeah. And, but then, then there's also guys that have boats at marinas and have a relationship with the marina that allows customers to come to the marina, jump on the boat, you know, take it out, bring it back. And same thing, that owner really doesn't have to deal with it a whole lot. It, I have it on a trailer because it's my personal boat. But yeah, either you can be as creative as you want within the, I guess, the, the legality of your, of your area will, will allow it. Some, some places are a little tighter than others, um, but we have creative owners that, that, that work around it. And not only does the insurance cover your boat while it's being rented and on the water, but there's also uh, trailering coverage. So your boat is covered while being trailered within 250 miles of the location where it's regularly stored. So on, say, an eight-hour rental, that's not even giving someone much time to get outside of that radius. So your boat's covered while it's uh, being transported, too, if you do have it on a trailer and you're letting the renters pick it up. Very cool. It sounds like you guys have really kind of thought about everything. Uh, sure seems at like this, it, yeah. At this point, uh, probably dealt with just about everything, I would imagine, too. Um, so you, you know what to help people see, how to help people see around corners. They, we've been talking the whole time about, you know, boat owners and renting a boat. For folks that maybe are or are not familiar with boat setter as a boat renter, uh, is there anything new with you guys for folks that want to rent a boat? I mean, you know, Butch and I live about three hours apart and he came over this past spring, brought his boat with him. And after launching the boat for the third time that weekend and dealing with it, we were both going, man, you know, probably would have been better if we could have just found a boat to rent while you were here. This was a lot of work. We spent yeah. a, we spent as much time fiddling with the boat and launching the boat and, re, and more. putting the boat back on the trailer and keeping the boat stored as we did actually fishing. So I can definitely see the advantages of being able to rent. Oh yeah. And, and being able to just get that thing. You just need it this one time, you know, like I, I do this once a year. I don't need to own a boat to do this. I could see the advantage of that, but is there anything new out there for folks that, that do want to rent a boat? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, boats that did start off, you know, focused on boat rentals. And then as we've grown, we have added more experience options. And so, uh, you know, like I mentioned, fishing charters are also an option to book uh, on Boat Setter. Uh, we've got a lot of great captains uh, partnered already, and we'll be growing out uh, that network, especially next year and beyond. We've got other types of charters and tours, uh, whether it's, you know, eco tours or sandbar hopping, snorkeling, diving trips, um, and, you know, yachts uh, to go, you know, for bachelor parties, celebrating engagements, uh, whatever it may be. Another new uh, and exciting program we launched uh, this year is uh, actually called Boat Setter Academy. And that is a free uh, on the water instruction with a Coast Guard licensed captain course where it's uh, just two hours um, and it's free for, you know, depending on the location in the boat, uh, it's typically four to six people. Um, so you're getting, uh, you know, hands-on um, training with a small group um, and learning just the basics of boat operation, safe navigation and docking in a just safe uh, controlled environment. And so that's actually, uh, you know, quickly become the largest uh free school for um, on the water boat training. Um, and we're really excited about expanding that to, to more markets. Uh, I think it's in eight markets so far, and uh, that'll be an option for people new to boating to, to start to get into it. I've seen some of our listeners at the boat launch trying to put their boat in water and get it back out. <laughs> like some of you guys need to go need to some the help. boat setter Academy yeah. for sure. Do, y'all, do, you, do you have that as part of the course? Cause if you don't, <laughs> You need to add it. Like here, hey, here's here's how you do a boat launch. Uh, here's boat launch etiquette 101. <laughs> boat launch 101. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, I think we know, we might need to try to partner with qualified captain and, uh, and <laughs> expand the program with that. That's huh. right, man. But not even being a new boater, man. That's a great thing for you know anybody that just hasn't run a boat in in a little while, man. A refresher course and education is always always a great option. So that's really that's really cool. I like the academy idea a lot. 
Well, it's very cool, guys. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. I, I didn't realize that this market was so developed, really, for boat rentals. Not just, I mean, I knew that you know, as a guy wanting to rent a boat, it's pretty easy to do, but for boat owners to be able to get access to their own asset, you know, and and leverage that asset into additional income is really cool. It's, it's basically, you know, you see you've seen it happen with vacation rentals. You've seen it happen with RVs. You, you've seen it happen with cars and, and you guys are doing it with boats. And uh, that's a really cool option for folks to have because, hey, let's face it, boats are expensive, you know, no matter from the, the top end to the bottom end, they're all expensive. So uh, it's a yeah. great way to def- defray some of that cost. If if our folks want to go check out what it takes to rent their boat, see what kind of boats you guys have available, where you have them available, maybe kind of do some market research and see, how, see if this is a viable thing for them, where would you point them to first? Yeah, the first thing I would say is go ahead and download the Boat Setter app. The app, you know, will let you search any location, see what's available, um, and just give you a great experience looking at the boat listings um, anywhere. And then uh, it'll allow you to save boats that you're interested in for later. Yeah, just really see everything that's available and filter it to different experience types or boat types. And check out boatsetter.com and our, our support section uh, if you want to look through FAQs um, and then our YouTube uh, just, that's just boat setter on YouTube um, has some quick uh, short explainers on uh, you know the owner side and also on the renter side of uh, what information is needed um, what should I keep in mind what are tips for having a great trip things like that and by all means, too, if you you know want to get in touch with our fishing team specifically, you can reach us uh, at fishingteam at boatsetter.com by email or follow us on social media and send us a DM. Uh, you know, you've heard from Jason and I, and hopefully we sound friendly, but yeah, we'll get back to you <laughs> and, and chat. Um, and yeah, we'd love to tell anybody more who's interested. Well, Luke, Jason, uh, it's been a pleasure, guys. I appreciate y'all joining us and uh Hope you guys have a uh, happy holidays where it's just right around the corner. Y'all, y'all be safe on all your travels and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. We hope the Great. same thanks, for guys. y'all and really appreciate the opportunity to speak to y'all's listeners. Butch, what can you not buy on your phone now? I mean, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're... yeah, pretty scary to think about really, but yes, uh, I need a pizza you can a boat. and a boat and a place to stay tonight, please. Thank you might you. even be able to get a boat that you can stay on and a pizza delivered. I think that is possible. Actually, I think that sounds possible from what and, those it sounds seen. like. There's probably somebody on boat setter that, that offers it all. Like you be yeah. like, I'd like a boat that I can sleep on with a pizza there. When I get there, Yeah, I'll drive it to you. Nah, man. <laughs> very, very, very cool segment. It sounds like those guys have thought about everything. I mean, like you were saying, they have, they probably have, have had so many objections kind of working all the kinks of this thing. They got it figured out pretty smooth. It seems like a pretty good operation. Yeah. If they're doing this all over the country, I mean, they're, they're yeah. dealing with all the problems that could potentially come, which is where my brain goes first. It's like, all right, what could go wrong? Like money yeah. sounds good, but what could go wrong? And you know, the big thing to me that I heard was having that insurance in place. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's Jeez. peace of mind knowing that really any anything from something incidental small all the way up to catastrophic is going to be taken care of you hope that none of that happens right but murphy's law for sure yep so, i got to figure it out man one of the things that i really enjoyed or, or stuck out to me was the whole academy the yeah. uh, boat setter academy man that's a big deal like <laughs> like i think you made a joke I've seen uh, some of our people operate and that's mm. obviously a joke all of our people know exactly what they're doing oh yeah no i mean um, that's but just places. because you can afford a boat does not mean you can drive one and i've seen that time and time again yeah very cool stuff from boat setter y'all go check it out all right guys that was another great segment you guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors that segment was brought to you by dixie supply and baker metalworks dixie supply and baker metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the gulf coast buy it today pick it up today they offer 20 sherwin williams colors to choose from and have a 40-year warranty baker metal and dixie supply two names same great service with the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. And also brought to you by National Land Realty. If you're in the market to sell your land, check out the fastest growing, most innovative land brokerage in the country. With the largest online presence in the industry, bottom line is that when you market your land through National Land Realty, the right buyers will know your land is for sale. Contact your local National Land agent at nationalland.com. 
All right, guys, you know, we got to do what did you learn before we get out of here today? I learned a ton this week. Uh, man, that boat setter thing is super cool. Kind of sounds like it's a good time of year to be on the water. I'd imagine that most people that live around here with boats are going to be kind of fishing. And luckily in Alabama, we just don't get that many off weeks. You know, we might get a freezing day here or there, but man, you can pretty much be on the water year round living in South Alabama. So that's always good. But, you know, if you got a winter or you, you vacation down here and you keep your boat in either place, I think the boat setter thing would be a great option to offset some of your, you know, your costs or your boat note. Um, it's just something interesting. Definitely going to check that out. A couple of things I took away from the reports. Um, Captain Bobby sounds like he's really trying to get dialed in on that slick junior. I took a note that he likes the one eighth ounce on the junior. Uh, I've definitely been messing with those hooks as well, trying to get that dialed in. Also thought it was very interesting how he was able to work the slick juniors uh, the way he was telling the guys to work it like a mirror lure. I definitely like that template. And then you can kind of hone in what works best for your particular application and your particular cadence whenever you get that figured out. All right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. You guys take a quick break and check out a few more of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Killer Doc. As anglers, we put a lot of time, money, and passion into fishing, but most of us do not have a fish cleaning station that we are proud of. Many of us are suffering from dock dysfunction. A rod and table with rusty metal, this is just no good. But the dock enhancement that we've all been waiting for is finally here. Killer Doc uses marine-grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Doc combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDoc.com to see more. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please make sure and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to text the word FISHING to 314-665-1767 to get that free AFCO Sun Protection Mask promo code and also to be added to our email list, and we'll send you the new show each week. You guys, keep whacking them. Be safe out there. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at thecoastalconnection.com. And also brought to you by Sam Stop and Shop. Sam Stop and Shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. And also... Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Did you know you could save up to 40% on your homeowner's insurance with a fortified roof? Learn more at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-973-9999. And also brought to you by l and Marine. l and Marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats, pontoons, as well as bigger bay hybrid boats for the hardcore angler. Go visit them at 34600 Highway 59 in Stapleton, Alabama, or call 251 251- 937-1380. And also brought to you by United Bank. United Bank supports our farmers with financial products and services designed specifically for agribusiness. All loans subject to credit approval, equal housing opportunity lender, member FDIC. And also brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available by the dozen at Bon Secure Fisheries, Inc. in Bon Secure, Alabama. From a simple, nutrient-dense appetizer at home or a shucking party with friends, Admiral oysters will steal the show. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. And also brought to you by Richardoni Family Dentistry. You're going to need a good dentist, so you may as well make an appointment with fellow angler Josh Richardoni. He provides services for all ages and accepts most dental insurances. Call today to book an appointment, 251-342-6672. And also by Photonist Defense, simply the best in-class night vision systems ever built. Contact them at photonistdefense.com to learn more. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. And also brought to you by Mallard Bay Outdoors. Book your next guided hunting or fishing trip with thoroughly vetted guides or charters. Built by sportsmen for sportsmen. MallardBay.com. 